Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about antiarrhythmic drugs. So just a quick note about this presentation. Um, you guys have a clean version, so to speak. Um, apologies for any highlighting marks here. You see that the drugs is highlighted there. Um, what happened was, uh, long story short, I basically I gave a live presentation and I saved it wrong and I tried to revert it back, but I think it's the whole PC to, to Apple thing that I have dealing with. It's been frustrating whatever and I was spending way too much time on it I was like hey I could have already probably given the presentation by now instead of trying to mess with this this stuff so apologies for that but um you know I'll just highlight that and hopefully it's not too distracting for, for you all you all y'all all right introduction to this presentation it's going to be a lot of FYI stuff for my test for my class uh testing purposes for pharmacology um so this is just this may be beneficial for pathophys, may be beneficial for ICM. Again, some of this stuff is just in here for a complete picture. Um, students, there's been an, an, enough students that like this stuff in there, just it kind of helps them when they're studying. But um, don't worry about test questions coming from this for my exam or for pharmacology. Um, same thing here. Oops, but go ahead and, I mean, you can read through it too. It's good stuff. Um, same thing here, just a, a review for, for you all. This is maybe pathophys test questions will come from this. Um, but don't quote me on that. I mean, I don't <laughs> write the test or whatever. Same thing here, action potential. This will help a little bit with mechanism of action, um, but just, again, FYI for, for my test. Uh, but read through that. Pretty good stuff. I like the visualization. I like these because um, it helps me, but um, and maybe I'm a little more visual, but, you know, don't stress too much about memorizing that for, for my exam. Um, same thing here. Just go ahead and read through this, electrophysiology. And this too, again, other than just you will see some of this terminology and in some of the mechanisms of actions, which I do want you guys to be responsible for, right? As always, same thing here. All right, this is a good presentation, right? <laughs> um, just, you know, a lot of FYI stuff. So here is something that you guys will be learning in depth with, um, with your EKG class. Um, just real quick too. Just a quick side note, again, this is FYI um, for your EKG class. Um, so fast forward through this, it doesn't have anything to do explicit with pharmacology, but this is um, advice from my wife. Um, she used to teach the EKG class um, for the PA students, and this is the book that she recommends. Uh, she uses this as a medical student, medical resident, etc. It's Rapid Inter Interpretations of EKGs by Dr. Dale Dubin. Um, so you'll hear this referred to as Dubins or whatever um, by short. Um, again, I have no sponsorship or any affiliation with this one, uh, just that we feel like this is the best book for EKGs. And I believe that this was the book that your course will be based off of. Um, so the other thing too is that um, if you don't want to buy it, it's, you know, there's used copies and stuff, or whatever. There, you, you can, it's pretty easy to find free PDFs here online. So I just Googled it and this is, you know, free PDF of the whole book. Um, so you don't have to necessarily wor worry about ordering it. And the other thing is too, so there's always a student or two that looks up this author, Dale Dubin. So he has kind of a shady past, but don't let that bother you too much as far as when you're learning the book. I mean, I definitely, we don't endorse his lifestyle or whatever, or some of the things he maybe did. Um, but you know, definitely um, great book. And then my wife's advice for students is always, you know, it, EKGs are, are they're difficult. They're even difficult for you know seasoned physicians and everything. Um, and so it's just it really takes practice. And so her biggest thing is like you have to kind of go through the book three, four times before you can really get good at EKGs. Um, but anyway, so that's just a little plug there. Just want to make sure everyone's aware of this textbook. All right, but for pharmacology, you don't have to stress about it too much. I joke that the only thing pharmacology pharmacologists or pharmacists care about is the QT interval. So you've noticed with some of the antibiotics and some of these other drugs we talked about, QT prolongation, right? So, um, oops, this is the, the PQRST wave, right? Uh, PR interval, QT interval. So this is the interval that we're talking about in pharmacy or in pharmacology when we talk about this Q QT prolongation. So basically what it means is that this interval here is elongated or stretched out and then that can cause um, cardiac abnormalities, right? So this is what this is how the beat should normally go, right? The or the electrical conduction should normally look, right, over time. Um, but so that's that's the only one that you know. So increase. That's why I wrote this here when I was giving this live lecture. Um, increase QT is the. It's not necessarily that it goes up, but it actually widens, so it gets longer. So there's there's more time. That the x-axis is time, right? So that x-axis increases. Um, and the only reason I mention that is because, like I said, it, it comes into play with a lot of adverse effects for medications. Um, and, and so you'll see that 
and definitely pay attention to any time I, I note that QT prolongation, definitely pay attention to it. It's definitely something you'll see on your boards um, and, and on my exams as well. So two for one, right? Um, and you also need to think of the implications of that. So if a person has an arrhythmia disorder or if they're on any other antiarrhythmics um, medications, which we'll see those implications here in a little bit, and then you're given an antibiotic, let's say, that increases QT prolongation, then what are the implications, right? So maybe that'll increase the risk of an arrhythmia for the patient. Um, and so that's why I, I joke that that's all we care about in pharmacy. It's not 100% true. There are some drugs and stuff that, you know, but anyways, main kind of take home point from this slide, at least for, for testing purposes for me and then uh, for success on your board when it comes to the pharma, pharmacological questions, increase QT or QT prolongation. Uh, normal sinus rhythm, again, it's just here, FYI, don't don't stress about this. There was one time when my wife gave this lecture, and so she was she spent a lot more time on some of this stuff that I don't. Um, this is a good definition, just to make sure everyone's on the same page here. Um, but arrhythmias are irregularities in heart rhythm, um, and that they there's different things that can cause those, so pulse generation, impulse conduction, or it can be both, right? So you can have both things coming into play. Um, so as far as the anti medications are concerned, um, they they affect a number of different factors. So read through those, um, and they all have varying effects on the electrophysiology. And that's going to be part of the reason that they're they're grouped the way they are. And so the grouping is going to be very important for these medications. So you notice when I gave the live lecture, I was highlighting this like crazy and yelling at the students. No, I wasn't yelling at them. But um, definitely, please look at this. Make sure that you. Um, memorize and you learn which classes are are which and so uh, and definitely that means also class 1a class 1b and 1c I put a, a big bracket here these are all evolve involve sodium so that's one way to um, to think about these these all affect sodium which we'll talk about a little more in detail here here we have the pass potassium that's affected here calcium calcium channel blockers beta blockers so you guys remember those from antihypertensive and then we have our miscellaneous antiarrhythmic agents here so um, again, just a caveat, depending on what textbooks you look at, um, depending on what sources you go to, these may be classified slightly different, um, especially here with the miscellaneous. Those may be um, in different categories or whatever. But, um, but definitely these classes of antiarrhythmics, I really want you guys to learn and spend some time with uh, guaranteed test questions that will reflect this. And the big reason is because you'll see board questions where they'll refer to something as the person's on a class 1B antiarrhythmic, and they won't necessarily put that they're taking lidocaine, let's say. Um, and so they want you to be able to recall which ones are class 1B, which ones are class 1A, etc. Um, in practice, um, most general practitioners will refer to them just by their names. And, and um, But specialists, you know, you may, if you end up working with a cardiologist, let's say, or, or maybe a specialist clinic or on your rotations or whatever, or inpatient, um, I have come across where people will refer to them by their classes, and and so and talking to my wife too, it's it's rare for her to hear them just refer to them by their classes, but she's like, yeah, it's still out there, and probably probably cardiologist, um, main, mainly, but you know, it depends on the practitioner too, but but for testing purposes and then for your board exams, um, that is something that they want you to to pull from or be able to pull from. So first, first we have the class one. So these are all like I said, effect sodium. So these are sodium channel blockers. Um, so you can kind of make that generalization here for all class 1A, 1B, and 1C. Um, these can also be used as local anesthetics, which we'll talk about whether there's a big presentation later on. I can't remember which module right now, but I think, I don't know, whether you'll, we'll get a <laughs> lecture on that later. Um, and they basically, mechanism of action is that they bind to open um, or inact inactivate sodium channels. So they're sodium channel blockers, right? So you'll be safe as, as long as you remember that for mechanism action. And then just a couple notes about lidocaine. Um, in its class, in this class, um, in the class one as a whole, it is maybe more effective in the treatment of ventricular arrhythmias, uh, where the quinidine is maybe more effective in the treatment of atrial arrhythmias. So this is just showing the effects of class one antiarrhythmic drugs on the action potential and then on the ECG, but um, don't stress too much about this as far as uh, memorizing it for my, my course. It's just here, kind of more FYI. It does help some students and it helps them remember, um, but uh, and I'm not sure if in pathophysiology you'll see charts like this or not, or an ICM. So first we have class 1A. 
Um, and so these mainly block sodium channels, but then they also have a little bit of effect or they also block the potassium channel. So that's what makes them a little bit different. Um, but so then, yeah, globally, or you can think of it as in whole as being affecting sodium. But then remember that these also have a little bit. And what does that do? It just basically makes it more effective. It just prolongs the accent potential. And then I put this little mnemonic here that hopefully helps you guys memorize these. But you have your three to memorize, and it's the queen proclaims Deso's pyramid. So, you know, these are always silly and everything and whatever. If they help, they help. If not, um, sorry. But, <laughs> but anyways, hopefully they're helpful. Uh, first, we have the quinidine. So mechanism of action, take-home point, sodium channel blocker, right? Um, so that's hopefully going to be pretty easy for you guys to remember. So in, in, in addition to them being antiarrhythmic, they also cause vasodilation. Um, I also mentioned, too, that these 1A will also block the potassium channels. So something to please note. So it's sodium channel blockers, and then 1A also affects the potassium channels. Um, and then also related to their mechanism of action, too, it's a threefold or three-pronged, as they also block muscarinic receptors. So we have sodium, potassium, and muscarinic for the quinidine. So this one's you will probably remember from anti um, antimicrobials, but this one is can be used as for malaria, and it's a, a malaria adjunct, whatever. Um, but then it's also used for antiarrhythmics. So I've had students in the past, you know, ask me about classification. So the good thing about the module is I won't just purely refer to this about you know as being or you know antimicrobial. Please know it's that it's a one A. Um, for, for this testing purposes and stuff. But then after you get out and practitioner and then board exams, et cetera, you'll need to be able to make those connections that it does does both, right? Um, and then we have some lists here. Just go ahead and read through that. Uh, but basically it helps with the min maintenance of sinus rhythm. Adverse effects. So um, we're gonna notice here, there's gonna be a theme or kind of, again, like with anticoagulation, you have to be worried about bleeding. The, it's kind of paradoxical and sometimes students kind of scratch their heads about it. And I know when I was first a student, I was like, what? Um, what is going on here? But so with antiarrhythmics medications in general, you want to think about them, not only that they can help treat the arrhythmias, but that they can also cause the cause arrhythmias or cause electrical disturbances, etc. So we're seeing a, a perfect example of that here where they can cause torsades de points, uh, which is French. And so part of my French accent, I don't know if anyone speaks French, but um, it basically means the twisting of the points. So it twists the QR, or it looks like a twisting of the points rather, um, on uh, the QRS complex. Um, and there's increased QR, QT prolongation. And that basically means that there's an increased risk for arrhythmias. So this, when you see this torsades the points, um, just know that that means increased risk of arrhythmias. And, and then there's also some ECAG changes, which for, I put FYI here just for my testing purposes, but um, it probably may not hurt for other other courses and stuff that you're taking, um, but but don't worry about memorizing those for, for my test. But definitely adverse effect. I want you to, to note this one and please uh, please you know study study that. And then here is just what a visual exam visualization of this twisting of points again maybe helps an EKG or whatever. But um, but don't stress about that for me. But that's what they mean by the twisting of points. I guess I should look it up. I've never Google translated to a size of points. It was just my professor said that in pharmacy school, and I've just been repeating that ever since, but are you kidding me, Google? Look, check this out. So Google Translate, the one time I decided to do this, I French, towards side the points, English, towards side the points. So, all right, so we'll need another, I'm not gonna waste a ton of your guys' time me trying to dig on this, but I just thought this was a funny Google Translate. So uh, thanks a lot, Google. No, um, but let's just see if you just, yeah, so Torsades, if you just, okay, well, anyways, I won't spend too much time on it. Sorry, before I get distracted, I said that was funny. All right, so that, yeah, don't worry about that as far as adverse effects, definitely pay attention to this. I put a star by this top one here because this is the most common adverse effect. The other ones are rare but serious, so the synchronism and the thrombocytopenia, uh, less common, but, you know, potentially more serious adverse effects, but GI adverse effects are going to be your, your main concern as far as common adverse effects are go. Uh, next, we have procainamide. Um, this one, it can also be used as a local anesthetic, so we'll talk about that later. You'll see that again, too, and you, or you may have come across that as a local anesthetic in your, in your, um, your pre-PA experience. And um, it's nice because it's similar to, qu to quinidine as far as its cardiac and toxic effects. So um, you can think about that. But additional adverse effect that you have to note, rare but serious, is the drug-induced lupus. Um, so please note that. And then um, 
it can be used, like I said, for anesthetic purposes or to help reduce pain, but then um, here's some other uses here. Just go ahead and read through those. Now we have class 1B. So this is I buy Liddy's Mexican tacos to help you remember this, hopefully. Um, but again, I mean, it, these help, they help, they don't, they don't. I, they, I could never use these in pharmacy school. These just always mess me up. I would remember the sentence, but then I don't know. Or I'd get the sentence mixed up or I'd be like, yeah, I'd buy Linda. Or I don't know. I just mess things up and uh, they didn't never worked for me. But if they help. They help. Some students like them, I know. Uh, so then we have the list of the class 1B. Again, just showing where it's, it has its effect. Mechanism of action, again, probably no surprise. Sodium channel blocker, right? Um, and then if this is 1B, so you'll notice you don't have to worry about the uh, potassium or it affecting muscarinic receptors, etc. So this one's a pretty straightforward mechanism of action. Lidocaine. So this is another one that you will see, again, when we talk about the um, anesthetics or for pain reduction. So this is let's use the local anesthetic. A lot of times, if I don't know if you guys have had stitches or whatever, but we'll get more into that. But it's also used as a potential um, or potentially can be used as an antiarrhythmic. Um, kinetics. There, just read through it. Um, don't don't worry about that. Um, for for me, or don't stress about that. Uh, Mechas of action. Um, definitely read through that. But again, what does it do? It is a sodium channel blocker, right? Use. Um, so this one is considered a DOC, which is abbreviations for a drug of choice. Um, for acute, and you can actually read through the years, MI, cardiac manipulation, etc. cetera. Um, however, more recent guidelines will notice that it's not, so you look here at the 2013 guidelines, um, that they aren't, um, as for, they weren't as recommended as first line as much as they used to be. So historically, these were used more for arrhythmias. Um, now you see it mainly used more for a local anesthetic. Um, so I would bet that that's probably how you're going to be seeing it. But anyways, but it's just here for historical purposes. And still, I want you guys to have that association that it is still um, a class 1B antiarrhythmic, right? Adverse effects. So arrhythmias, again, unfortunately... Um, it is pro-arrhythmic. Pro just means that it's, you know, can cause it. Um, and then specifically in the elderly population, you do have to be concerned with seizures. So, and, and then too, especially if the person is already prone to seizures or if they're on other medications that can lower the seizure threshold, which, um, I, I think I may have already explained this before, but there's certain medications, basically what, if you lower the seizure threshold, you basically make it easier to have a seizure. So you, this is something you need to be thinking about as far as drug interactions are concerned with lidocaine, is that are there other medications that can lower the seizure threshold? Tokenide and Luxetine, pretty easy. I'm not, sorry, pretty easy. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say easy, but, so I'm, I'm sorry. I know students hate it when I say easy, but pretty straightforward, I guess I should say they're pretty, um, pretty similar. And so you can kind of lump them, lump them together. Um, this is just kind of, they are PO, uh, which can be an advantage. Um, and just the kinetics, just read through those. Um, so again, oral PO treatment can be, can be good. Um, and then the meloxetine is interesting too, because it can also be used for diabetic neuropathy. And the, the other thing to note too, which I forgot, so I'm backing up a little bit here, is that the zucanonide is no longer a um, sold in the United States, so it still is made in the world, but um, no longer available in the U.S. So it's more for historical purposes. So you can go ahead and cross that out for testing purposes. I won't pull that one on the. I won't put that one in the text. But the meloxetine still is made, and like I was saying, um, it can be used um, at, for an off-label use as the uh, treatment of diabetic neuropathies. However, um, I would stay away from it. We'll see what the adverse effects and it has some box warnings we're going to talk about in a minute. So um, that's just really kind of an FYI. Um, just think of it mainly as being used um, for ventricular arrhythmias. And it's really specifically for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias um, as far as its use is concerned. But um, but yeah, so this, oops, sorry. This use here is just kind of FYI and like not first, even second line. Um, and we'll get into these because the adverse effects. A lot of adverse effects to think about here. Uh, most common are going to be the cardiovascular adverse effects. So arrhythmias is one. Um, unfortunately, can make it make it worse. Some CNS adverse effects. So dizziness is there listed there, um, but also nervous nervousness and steady gait. 
Um, and then GI is a big one as far as common adverse effects go. So upset stomach, vo nausea, vomiting, etc. Um, and then it can also cause tremor too, which is pretty com common. Um, and then as far as their box warnings go, there's actually a couple box warnings here. Um, the first one is just pretty scary is, is on is mortality. Um, so it's just basically saying that so there was this long-term trial, it's called the CAST trial. Um, so it just basically, it was a giant double-blinded study um, with asymptomatic non-life-threatening -life ventricular arrhythmias who had an MI more than six days, um, but then less than two years previously, and excessive mortality or non-fatal cardiac arrest rates was seen in patients treated um, uh, with certain antiarrhythmic medications. and so. The, basically, the FDA warning says, considering the known proarrhythmic properties of meloxetine and the lack of evidence of improved survival for any antiarrhythmic drug in patients without life-threatening arrhythmias, um, the use of meloxetine as well as other antiarrhythmic agents should be reserved for patients with life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. So that's part of its use, too. So um, its adverse effect, unfortunately, it's, it can cause arrhythmias that can kill the person. And so this needs to be only reserved and only used. And that's what I was saying, you know, maybe... It can be used for, could be beneficial for diabetic neuropathies, but because of the box warning, I would stay away from it um, because it basically increases the risk of death. And so only used for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, another box warning, too, is that there is a um, potential for acute liver injury. Um, so it can be toxic to the liver, which is another, um, another thing to think about. Um, but interesting enough, you don't need to make dose adjustments if a person has hepatic impairment. And again, just please make sure you're using it for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. Class 1C, we have the flecainide and profenanone. Can I have fries, please? <laughs> may helpful, maybe not. So just a couple here, the 1C. Again, they here's the visualization. If you guys help you. Mechanism of action, basically, again, sodium channel blocker. Um, so just take on point there. Use. So again, this is kind of like the mexlatine. Um, it's not going to be first line choice and that it should only be used for life threatening ventricular arrhythmias and then maybe when, even when other drugs fail. So, um, so it, it, because they are very pro arrhythmogenic. So both of these have box warnings for mortality and it's similar to what I said before. Um, it was from that same trial that CAST, C-A-S-T, um, a cardiac arrhythmia suppression test, or um, suppression trial rather. So that's C-A-S-T, cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial um, is the... Um, the big study that they did, and they just basically showed that these drugs are um, can actually cause death, and so they should only be reserved for life-threatening um, ventricular arrhythmia. So, like I said, they both have those box warnings. Um, and then the flecainide has an additional box warning for ventricular prorhythmic effects in patients who have AFib or A-flutter, so atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Um, so you, flecainide then should be used in, you know, extra, with extra cautious if a patient already has AFib or A-flutter. Um, so, so anyways. So with class two, this is going to be a little bit of review from the antihypertensives. So this is ones you guys are probably already familiar with. These are the beta blockers. So beta adrenergic receptor antagonist is another way to say that. Um, but... I want you guys to think of them as being antihypertensive drugs um, and definitely think about those, you know, as far as being, you know, being beta blockers, but also please to remember and note specifically which ones can be considered class two antiarrhythmic. So that will be important um, for testing purposes. So make sure you, again, you, you have the both categories there. And like I said, you probably remember these propranolol, metoprolol, and then esmolol is the one that was in the hypertensive emergencies or can be used for that. And that one is IOV only. Propranolol, so other than the, I mean, all these different uses here, um, some of these we'll talk about in, in different uh, modules here, but it can be used for um, the PSVT and AFib. Um, so anyways, and specifically for patients that are recovering from MI. Adverse effects, so we talked about some of these before, but sedation or hypotension, sleep disturbances, sexual dysfunction, cardiac disturbances, unfortunately, too, like the other antiarrhythmic drugs. And then asthma is a contraindication. So asthma, COPD, you can add COPD there too, but uh, basically a per person has problems breathing because this beta blockade that you're doing with the medication can actually um, make ble breathing more difficult. And that'll be fully elucidated, as, as they say. That'll be fully explained um, in the pulmonology module, but um, 
And basically, when you block the beta receptors in the lungs, it makes breathing more difficult. Metoprolol, um, similar, but then it is more selective, which we talked about before. Um, and then it's used to treat all these different things here. Just go ahead and read through those. And then Esmolol, um, this one, again, review from the um, hypertensive emergencies lecture. So you can refer to that as far as what I said all about it then. Um, but then just go ahead and add these uses to it as well. Atenolol um, is also here. It's was one that um, you it won't it depends on the textbook and stuff that you look at you may see this one you may not because it is considered an off-label use so this is not an FDA approved use um, but it's still but so in an off-label sense it can still be classified as a class 2 antiarrhythmic and you can read through those those uses there too um, but then it's all it's mainly classified as an antihypertensive and that's what its official FDA approved uses are for class 3 so these are the potassium channel blockers there's the list there, and the, uh, brief, the mnemonic there is AIDS, and that can help you maybe memorize which ones are potassium channel blockers. Mechanism of action, take home point, they block potassium channels. So hopefully that'll be um, good for you guys to, for studying and, and uh, for recall, future reference. Can, so first off, for the class three, we have amiodarone. Um, and this one is, um, the far the kinetics go, don't stress too much about it, but just know that this is going to be related to, we're going to, it has a lot of bad adverse effects and, um, some box warnings. Um, and because of its long half-life that can actually make it more problematic. So you notice the hundred and up to 103 days. Um, don't stress about memorizing that, <clears throat> excuse me, gotta get that cough button installed in here. I'm trying not to cough and like blast your guys' eardrums or whatever, or sneeze or whatever. I have a lot of seasonal allergies right now. Um. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, yeah, so don't stress about memorizing that it's 103 days, but just know the implications of that. What does that mean? Really long half-life. We're going to talk about these adverse effects, box warnings, um, and then what are the implications there? Spoiler alert, just usually means really long half-life, just means more chance of adverse effects, right? And, um, and some problems with the drug. Mechanism of action here. Um, read through all this, but again, for take-home poison purposes. Um, blocks potassium channels. Go ahead and you can just highlight that. But it does have some effects on some other things. Um, I want you guys to at least read through that. Uses. So this is a drug that has, it really only has one FDA approved use. It's ventricular arrhythmias and it's specifically for the management of life-threatening recurrent ventricular fibrillation or recurrent hemodynamically unstable ventricular tachycardia, refractory to other antirhythmic agents or in patients intolerant of other agents for these conditions. So even by its FDA admissions, typically not first line. Uh, but then as far as its off-label uses go, it has a ton of off-label uses. Um, and so you will maybe see it a lot. Um, so for example, in patients who have heart control, um, I'm sorry, heart failure, who um, who require heart rate control, is what I was gonna say, I got kind of ton tongue tied there. Tongue -tied there. Um, so inpatient, you will see it used for some different things. I'm also maybe off labels for maintenance of sinus rhythm after cardioversion of atrial fibrillation. Um, but because of the adverse effects here, which we'll get into, um, it's again, used with caution and typically not first line. So like with a lot of these antiarrhythmic drugs, you'll notice the cardiovascular effects and where they can cause arrhythmias, unfortunately. Um, it also has some, uh, some toxicity potentially for, um, for the liver, well, and also to, not on here, but I just remembered, um, related to cardiovascular effects, effects too is a hypotension. Um, so that is something that you'd have to watch out for well, when you administer this medication. The, um, the liver effects, like I was saying too, so um, unfortunately can have uh, cause abnormal hep hepatic function test, hepatic diseases, and then increase the um, hepatic enzyme, so increase ALT and AST. And then we have some other effects too. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read through those. Those are more uh, rare but serious. And then the other one that's not on here is a common adverse effects is, is GI, uh, GI up upset, so nausea, vomiting um, is one of those common ones that can happen with this. Um, so, it, and then related to these adverse effects are the box warnings. So this does have a number of box warnings. Um, one is that it 
has a box warning for life-threatening arrhythmias, and so specifically for the tablets. Um, and so that's something to be considered about. Um, also potential fatal toxicity. So with these toxicities, um, listed here some of these adverse effects, but then other toxicities. The most important one of those is a pulmonary toxicity um, that can happen. But, uh, but anyways, you can also have liver injury, etc. And then there's also, um, there's a box warning for a quote, high risk patient. Um, so this is even in patients at high risk of arrhythmic death in whom the toxicity of amiodarone is an acceptable risk. Amiodarone possesses major management problems that could be life threatening in a population at risk of sudden death. Therefore, make every effort to utilize alternative agents first. So again, it's pretty strong language from the FDA as far as um, just, you know, be cautious with it. You still see it being prescribed and used, um, but it is something to, um, to, to look at. And then, um, and then with those toxicity concerns too, like I mentioned the pulmonary and then hepatic toxicity specifically, um, it's just a problematic drug. It's kind of a, what I'll sometimes, you'll sometimes hear me say it's a messy drug or a dirty drug, whatever. it just means that there's a lot of adverse effects and a lot of things you have to be concerned with. So, um, definitely spend some time and, and make sure you, um, you know these adverse effects for amiodarone. Uh, butylide here um, is another class three. Um, so take on point mixing action blocks potassium, but go ahead and read through that and make sure you know the other things. Um, as far as its uses are concerned, um, it can be used for atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. And that is pretty, that's consistent with current guidelines. Um, but then they also have, it also has some box warnings. Um, so not a surprise that it has a box warning for life-threatening arrhythmias and that it can unfortunately cause potentially fatal arrhythmias. Um, so it should be used cautiously because of that. And then also related to that, it's, um, there's a, a box warning for appropriate treatment environment because it's essential that this medication is administered in a setting where you can have continuous ECG monitoring and then personal personnel trained to identify and treat acute ventricular arrhythmias um, because it's just it has such a high risk of causing arrhythmias. Dofetilide, um, another class three, um, mainly used, so mechanism of action, you know, potassium blockade. Um, use is for atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Um, it can be used for supraventricular tachycardia as an off-label use, uh, but then it also has a risk, a I'm sorry, a boxed warning for arrhythmias. And so um, they, the FDA recommends to minimize the risk of induced arrhythmia. Patients initiated or reinitiated on this medication should be placed on placed for a minimum of three days in a facility that can provide calculations of creatinine clearance and continuous ECG monitoring and cardiac resuscitation. Um, so it's interesting some interesting things there. Um, and it, it's noted that it also mentioned that creatinine clearance needs to be monitored because this can, um, uh, this can be more dangerous than a person who has renal impairment. So this is a medication that needs to be at the dose, um, the dosing changed if a patient does have um, renal impairment. And specifically if um, dose adjustments are required for patients with creatinine clearance less than 60 mils per minute. Sotalol. So this one, the brand name is Beta Paste, and the only reason I mention that is because you'll hear that being used a lot or people refer to it as that. Um, this one's a little bit interesting as far as, so it is a beta blocker. <laughs> I was hesitant to say that just because it confuses students as far as classification. So um, it can be accurately described as a beta blocker, um, but it also blocks potassium channels. So for antirhythmic purposes, classify it as a class three antiarrhythmic. So it's an antiarrhythmic agent, class three, um, but then it's also a non-selective beta blocker. But um, that's tripped up students in the past and just apologies, I mean, unfortunately, I didn't you know make up this antiarrhythmic um, classification, but because of its effect on the potassium channels is why it is a class three and not a class two like the other beta blockers. Um, but so anyway, so just please you know keep that straight. Um, the uses, read through that, and then adverse effects, um, Unfortunately, it can be prorhythmic and cause cause arrhythmias as well as, as has helped with some of them. Um, and it's, so it's, its main adverse reactions are cardiovascular. Um, so in addition, it can also cause bradycardia, which is and then um, chest pain and palpitations. Um, it also has some box warnings that you have to be 
concerned with. So one of the box warnings is for renal impairment. Um, so this is one that you definitely need to calculate the creatinine clearance prior to dosing. And then you do need to make dosing adjustments based on their renal impairment or you know um, where their creatinine clearance is. So um, for example, it'll affect how frequently you dose it. So if a creatinine clearance is greater than 60 mils per minute, you can dose it Q BID or Q12 hours. And then if they have a creatinine clearance below that, then it may only be Q day or, or Q24 hours. Um, so definitely, and again, it's related to a box warning. So um, please pay attention to that anytime you're, you're going to be prescribing this or, or dosing this. Um, the other thing too is there's also a box warning for life-threatening, or rather that this drug is life, it has life-threatening proarrhythmia. So um, related here, the prolonged QT interval and source odds of point is that this can cause life-threatening arrhythmias, unfortunately. So we have class four, calcium channel blockers. Again, review from the um, antihypertensive lecture, hopefully. And one quick thing with classification too. So these are calcium channel blockers. Um, you will per hopefully remember that when I talked about the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, well, verapamil and diltiazin are considered um, non-dihydropyridine. Um, so they're a little bit different. And so these are the only two that are, can be used for um, its antiarrhythmic properties. So there's other calcium channel blockers that we went over um, cannot. Mechanism of action, again, pretty review um, and take on point is that they are calcium channel blockers. So it's how it's classified, but then it's also its of action. And, um, and then also please note that it is a class four antiarrhythmic too, right, with classification. Um, read through those. And then these are interesting too because these also cause some vasodilation. Adverse effects here. Um, You'll probably remember hypotension, so that's a big one for the antihypertensives in general, but you have to be worried about that with this. Um, and then some other ones too, constipation more so with verapamil um, and edema AV block. The good news is with these, they don't, these two medications don't have the box warnings as far as their, um, well, they don't have any box warnings, but so maybe a little bit safer um, and less concerned with adverse effects and them being fatal, um, but, but anyways. Now we have the miscellaneous antiarrhythmic drugs. First off, adenosine, so very quick onset of action. Pharmacokinetics, don't worry too much about it. This one, um, interesting mechanism of action. So this one specifically enhances potassium con conductance, right? And then it in inhibits the CAMP, or the cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So what does that mean or what are the implications? So it's antiarrhythmic because it slows the conduction time through the AV node and then interrupt, interrupting the reentry pathways through the AV node, and then it'll help restore normal sinus rhythm, um, but specifically by affecting the potassium conductance and then this dependent calcium influx. So those are the two um, electrolytes that are involved there. Um, as far as its uses are concerned, um, so some um, a lot of different uses, I guess we could say, or a few um, specifically off-label uses, but um, its main FDA approval is for PSVT, which is proximal supraventricular tachycardia. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that is its main use. Um, they also note that it's not effective for conversion of AFib or A-flutter or ventricular tachycardia. Um, so that is something to note about its use. And then as far as the guidelines go, the, uh, the guideline recommendation is that the um, they recommend adenosine in acute management of a, vari a variety of supraventricular tachycardia. Um, so that's what they recommend. It's, it's going to be in first, first time use. Um, this is also interesting too. This is where they will use the adenosine um, for pharmacological stress tests. I don't know if you guys have heard of that where um, or you probably hear about an I ICM, et cetera, but this is one of those drugs that's, it has an FDA approval to be used to do those stress tests that you hear about. Um, and then it has some off-label uses like pulmonary artery hypertension, um, but but don't don't stress too much about looking all those up and getting getting to, to know all of those. Um, and then no, oh yeah, and then adverse effects here, I didn't list them, but generally well tolerated. Um, Unfortunately, like with all the other ones, you do have to be worried about cardiac arrhythmias. Um, so that is a potential adverse effect. Um, 
so that's something. And then other than that, it can cause some headache, dizziness, um, GI distress again, which you guys probably aren't surprised for me hearing that, but uh, that can happen. And then uh, dyspnea, for, so uh, trouble breathing, so respiratory adverse effect too are, are common ones. Dejoxin. So I'm not going to spend too much time on dejoxin right now. Um, just note that it is can be used for AFib. Um, and heart failure, but we will see this a lot. We're going to go into this more in detail in another presentation, another one of these cardiac, uh, cardio, cardiology lectures. Um, so, so just for, just know how it's classified um, as a miscellaneous, and then um, that it can be used for AFib and heart failure. But we'll, like I said, stay tuned. There's a lot more to talk about with the Jackson. IV magnesium. So as mechanism of action goes, they don't really know. It's not fully elucidated. Um, it can be used to help treat torsades points. Um, and then also used with um, uh, digitalis induced or, or digitoxicity arrhythmias. Um, and then it's also used for people who, are hy who have hypomagnesium, right? Um, but, but anyways, just note that IV potassium, um, this can help treat hypokalemia. And then it also helps with the digitoxicity when they have hypokalemia. So, it, and again, we'll talk about digitoxicity more in another presentation. Here's a great summary table. Again, I like these a lot, so make sure you look at them. Make sure you look at the adverse effects and contraindications. And again, even if they're not on the other slides, please add them there and you know make sure that you're getting getting in, or studying the information on all of these slides, including the tables. Um, and then we have here too um, just more of that. So that is it for this presentation. Please feel free, as always, to email me if you have any specific questions. Thank you all for your time and attention. Really appreciate it. And I will talk to you all later. Bye.